this week on the Back Table Podcast. So when we do complete occlusive flow, if because the stenosis is being treated and the balloon is up and you're getting full effacement, all of that pressure is waiting to burst through that dam. And so what I like to do is as the balloon is going up, I am decreasing at the arterial anastomosis, I'm occluding the AV access inflow. And then when we're done with the treatment, we will release it just a little bit again to restore some flow to shoot the angiogram to establish the result rather than just letting that whole pressure head run through this freshly dilated lesion, which may have been a very aggressive lesion. And we find that that has improved uh, significantly the, the risk of rupture, frank rupture, and again, bailout sort of procedures. And if you do get a, a problem, typically it's just balloon occlusion again, uh, wait three minutes or so, real minutes, by the way, that time. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things endovascular and minimally invasive. If you're a new listener, welcome. For all of our regular listeners, welcome back and thank you for listening. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or whatever platform that you like to listen to podcasts. You can also find all this stuff on our website, which is backtable.com. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a written review, or reach out to us on social media. We just want you guys to let us know how we can make this podcast a better resource for our community, and we're going to do our best to make that happen. Quick word from our sponsor, Medtronic. The Chameleon PTA Balloon Catheter from Medtronic is a unique multifunction high-pressure PTA balloon, enabling the user to infuse both diagnostic and therapeutic fluids all in one device without losing wire access. This device is indicated for treatment of obstructive lesions of native or synthetic AV dialysis fistulae. Today, we're going to be discussing dialysis access maintenance and surveillance. We have with us today here, Dr. Ari Kramer. Ari's a surgeon based out of Spartanburg, South Carolina. Ari, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to, uh, to be here with you guys. I'm a long-term listener of your podcast. Enjoy a great many topics and guests that you've had invited to your show. So Ari, first things first, will you just kind of tell us a little bit about your background and what your practice looks like? Absolutely. So uh, I'm a general surgeon by training, and I graduated in 2002. About 15 years ago, I devoted my entirety of my practice to surgical interventional needs of patients with renal failure. So our complete focus is the creation, maintenance, and salvage of AV access. And all of that training, really, I credit uh, Dr. John Ross, who many consider to be perhaps the most renowned access surgeon in the space. And uh, he basically created our template and model. What made you want to devote like your entire practice to this? Was this something that you knew going through general surgery that you wanted to do? Or was it that you kind of found yourself in a job that uh, then this is where the opportunity was and then you uh, decided to devote the the practice to it? Well, it's, it's a little bit of both. I've always had an affinity to uh, vascular specialties in general. But when we looked at where we are located in South Carolina, uh, there's very few places that have more need for the treatment and care of dialysis patients than in our uh, state. So in that, in view of that, the service line was fragmented and it was split between numerous specialties who were owning it in a poorly cohesive manner. And so the, the best way to establish uh, the model that, that John had shared with us was to uh, basically become the foundation for all access services, which is how we got started. Uh, and subsequently, that genesis of that, which started in 2005 in earnest, uh, we're now uh, the re referral for 70 referring clinics and nearly 40 different nephrologists. And I'm personally doing 1,500 uh, access-related procedures annually. Holy cow. So is it you and a couple other physicians and physician extenders? Uh, like, what does the practice look like? So it looks like me. <laughs> <laughs> The bedrock, okay. <laughs> and then uh, we do have uh, two extenders, uh, two nurse practitioners and a vascular access coordinator, all um, ultrasound tech in the office, and then uh, standard front office, uh, back office. But that's it. All right. Now, are you working out of uh, an OBL, hospital-based practice? Uh, HOPD, hospital-based practice. All right, HOPD, nice. All right, so let's talk about, let's just back up a little bit and talk about patients that will need an AV fistula or a graft. So this goes into a little bit about like AV fistula create, uh, creation in that 
How do these patients get plugged in to you? And at what time point is the referring, presumably nephrologist or maybe primary care doc, sending you patients who might need dialysis access? Well, I think um, a lot of this really is is contextual. And I think it, you'll find that it is uh, similar in my practices elsewhere. It's a bit of a hodgepodge. You know, there's the acute recognition of chronic events in most circumstances. And I think that kind of is summed up by what the USRDS data shows, which is that 80% of patients are starting dialysis with some form of catheter, only 60%. Uh, actually, 60% have a catheter only, and only 16% actually start with a fistula or graft that's maturing. Um, and so we're seeing a very similar trend in our area. We pick up you know, probably 30% of our cases from the hospital where, again, patients are identified as having some iatrogenic-induced injury versus you know, an acute injury on top of a chronic injury that's existing and we're, we're asked to evaluate. And then on the outpatient setting, there are uh, multiple dialysis centers that do refer to us either through uh, stage four kidney uh, evaluation and, and educational programs, uh, but much more frequently, it's the patient who has a pre-existing tunnels catheter that we've, we've placed or has been referred to us from an outside facility for evaluation and management of patients. Okay. And so there are a couple options for dialysis access. I, I think the most basic two that we think of are just uh, standard AV fistula or graft. Um, can you speak to maybe some of the uh, trainees or early practitioners in the audience? Like, um, just kind of describe the difference between both. So, like, define uh, the two dialysis access, and then you know, talk about pros and cons, just broad strokes. Sure. Well, if we're talking to um, to trainees, and I'd even remind myself of some of these things, the um, you know, the, the context of an AV fistula is obviously it's autogenous and it has a lot of upside that, you know, one of the number one killers of dialysis patients is infection. They tend to have a little bit lower um, maintenance attached to them. However, they're still imperfect because uh, approximately 40 percent in many series to even 50 percent in many series don't mature as opposed to having a, a graft uh, or prosthetic of any type, be it PTFV or uh, or, you know, bovine or whatever your, your basis for a graft is, we put those in, and those are essentially fully matured AV accesses. However, there's, there's concomitant risk, obviously, with infection and a higher intervention rate. Uh, you have two anastomoses. I would like to comment that regardless of either uh, type of access selected, I think you really need to understand the physiology of the AV access circuit first and foremost, because that kind of dictates what you're planning to do. Anytime we put an access in a patient, a portion of that blood flow takes the cardiac output directly to the venous circulation. And when we do that, you decrease the systemic vascular resistance, resistance and blood pressure. And that allows uh, increase in angiotensin, aldosterone, AVP. And subsequently, together, you end up with an increased contractility, and you end up with uh, systemic vascular resistance increases, total blood volume, et cetera, which then lead to the late complications that we know exist with all our patients. It makes them really troublesome and, frankly, dictates a lot of why we have to do intervention. And we end up with problems with uh, ventricular preload issues, left ventricular remodeling, right ventricular dysfunction, um, heart failure, et cetera. So, this is a big part of understanding what and why we want to do particular accesses for our patients. So actually, I guess because I'm not on the, as an interventional radiologist, I'm not on the creation portion of it, but all of those things that you just mentioned factor into whether or not you either keep patients on a dialysis uh, catheter or you move forward with a fistula or a graft. So all those things are pushing basically the choice of dialysis access for that patient. Absolutely. Um, all of those things dictate what we do, including, you know, the, the quality data for the patient. We can clearly identify that central venous catheters have a tremendous downside effect for patients. Obviously, there's a lot of upside in the fact because you don't actually get cannulation related injuries, but the downstream effects of central venous stenosis, endocarditis, broad seating abscesses across the body are, are tremendous downsides. Uh, but you don't get the cardiac events. Uh, but once you start running with full blood access all the time, that's when we start to see the remodeling issues and all the neurohumoral responses uh, to AV access failure. Interesting. So whenever you're working up a patient who either has no dialysis access or has a catheter in place, 
what are some of the things that you're uh, thinking of, or can you kind of paint um, uh, a hypothetical that may steer you down the road of um, not put, putting a fistula, but like maybe a graft is a better fit for that patient? Sure. Um, again, when we when we look at our technologies, I think you know it's the same whether you have a mature access or not. Um, the same decision making gets placed and, and is in place. It's a three legged stool. You have the patient, their functional anatomy, and that includes their cardiac performance. Remembering that the, uh, the all access starts at the heart, ends back at the heart. So we have to know the cardiac history of the patient, and then we have to look at the skill set of myself, the technique that I'm going to employ and try to marry my skills with what the patient has to, to get them the achieved goal, which is a running blood access, we hope. But then we also have to look at the uh, devices that we may employ. If any of those are, are misaligned, we end up in failure. And we have a lot of failure in access because we try to squeeze, you know, access into, uh, you know, square pegs all the time when they're perfectly round. Um, and that has a lot to do with the quality initiatives that we see and, and, you know, pressures from CMS and funding, et cetera. But when you really look at the, the broad scope of things, why would I not place a, a, uh, an AV access? Well, I think if you have a, a cardiac cripple, for example, uh, who's got profound right heart failure, uh, you're just asking for trouble by, you know, adding all this additional volume to the right heart, which is already uh, under immense strain. You get a narrowing of the pressures between the left ventricle, right ventricle, and uh, uh, pardon me, right and left ventricle, and suddenly you have an MI. So the coronary sinus perfusion pressure falls dramatically. So you have to keep all of these sort of issues in mind and forward in your thinking when we're talking about the planning of an access. So when we see a patient, the first thing we do is an assessment of that patient, and it's from a head-to-toe evaluation. But predominantly, we're focused on the vascular anatomy of the patient and the functioning of the heart. We would often like to have an echocardiogram uh, with the evaluation of that patient so we have a baseline so that we can understand where we're moving from, where we're going to, and we can then map out uh, how this patient is performing with the access. Um, so that, that's a, a large part of it. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned earlier, we have an ultrasound tech here in the office who's also completely dedicated to AV access. And when the patient comes in, not only do we do vein mapping, but we do a, a careful evaluation of the arterial tree because without inflow, you can have no outflow. Now, typically, the inflow is seldom the problem. Uh, however, it can be the problem, and it's not uncharacteristic for us to have to recruit services from other radiology services to get CTAs or uh, diagnostic angiographies with arch runoff and treatment uh, to get appropriate inflow established before we can move to the outflow. Absolutely. All right, so let's move on to like the meat of the topic, which uh, I kind of set the stage for earlier in that we're going to be talking about, you know, fistula slash graft maintenance and surveillance. So uh, one of the things I was interested in is, is how does your practice work as far as like once a access has been created, um, how do you keep up with it? Is it a combination of like once this patient is yours, they're forever yours, and so you're seeing them back periodically? Do you have the uh, dialysis units uh, participate or is it a combination of all these things? I think you've hit it on the last part. It's really a combination of all of these things. In my area, um, I'm typically the de facto uh, for access, maintenance, creation, salvage, abandonment. And so once the patient comes to the practice, typically we're responsible for all phases of uh, the access development. Now, we see the patients after access creation in surgery, the patient will typically follow back up with us within you know, seven to 10 days they'll get an ultrasound uh, to map the flow of the access, make sure that we have continuing success. Some uh, three weeks later, about 28 days post, uh, and, uh, post uh, creation, we'll follow up again to uh, see if we've achieved KDOKI uh, guidelines for cannulation. If those accesses are not mature in some way, shape or form, we will then uh, have the patient enter into our maintenance phase maturation phase, et cetera, at which time we can do angiography to establish or correct visible problems within the access circuit. Now, in the outpatient setting, if the patient has received dialysis for a period of time and is now meeting with failure, either related to cannulation injury, aneurysmal change, outflow stenosis, venous pressure issues, et cetera, bleeding complications, 
uh, they, they survey those patients uh, mostly in our area with something called transonic evaluations. And so uh, when that number falls less than six or 800, uh, they will trigger an intervention with a referral to the practice. Additionally, if there's a drop in 25% between one reading and the next reading, they will trigger an intervention for us to evaluate that patient. When the patient comes to the office at that time, they get a clinical examination, but they also follow up with a duplex to make sure that we can identify stenosis because many times as we go back to the cardiac circuit, we can't have a normal circuit, but a, a decrease in, in function, which might trigger a secondary intervention unnecessarily. So we would then default to cardiac uh, evaluations instead of primary intervention. All right. So there was a lot of things there that I, I, wanted, to, <laughs> I, I wanted to jump in and stop you, but you were on a good roll. Um, so the first thing I just wanted to back up, we talk about the guidelines to cannulation. Um, and just, you know, for the audience who maybe is not as familiar with that section of it, but like when, when is official or a graft or what really, when is official or ready to go? Well, uh, official is ready to go. Typically, Kadoki likes to talk about the rule of sixes. Uh, we usually use three sixes, but that's sort of, you know, not really an exciting thing to say is you've got six, six, six. So we had the fourth six, <laughs> uh, you know, devil's work being what it is and the devil's being in the details. So you've got 600 mLs of blood flow. You've got six millimeters of depth. You've got six millimeters of uh, diameter and you've got six centimeters of straight stickable surface. Those are typically what we call uh, K-Doki mature fistula criteria. And uh, by the way, it took me five years uh, to figure out after training that that's the reason we usually use six millimeter graphs, right? Uh, I, <laughs> right? That's I, where I, that number comes from. That's where that number comes from. All right. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is the dialysis centers that are doing some of the screenings on these patients was there a lot of legwork on your end to help them help you? Meaning that did you have to help them set up the criteria for screening? Like, do you have to go and, and uh, basically like discuss things with either dialysis access uh, managers or nephrologists in town to get them on board to do these screening to, uh, or to, to use these screening tools and metrics for you? So it's a, it's a little bit of both. I, I wouldn't lie and say that I just took the lead on this. You know, I was kind of pushed in many ways to assume the mantle. Uh, the okay. need was just such that, that there were so many unmet needs and that what we have found uh, is that the surgical practice is an ideal way to help navigate all of those interplays between the dialysis center and their issues the nephrologists with their immediate demands for new patients uh, and their planning for, for their outpatient schedules, et cetera. And so many people default to us. And so by nature of where we are in that continuation of the spectrum of the care of the patient, we end up on calls with dialysis centers, not infrequently, not only to talk about individual patients, but to look at the overall quality data catheter rates, fistula rates, graft rates, PD rates, intervention rate. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, we're a, a part of those dialogues and often lead the dialogue on where we're trying to move from and get to, and also where we're failing. And that, that includes our failures in timing to get the patient to surgery in a meaningful uh, way or to get a meaningful result for the clinics as well. So when you said uh, taking up the mantle, uh, one of the things I uh, kind of heard from you is that uh, there was there's in in part maybe um, uh, a leadership vacuum in this scenario, and then like you you've actually been you know uh, hoovered up by the vacuum, and, and then you've assumed like this position. Is is that like something similar to what's happened? I think hoovered up is a is a fair assessment of the circumstance, a very adequate de depiction. Okay. All right. Um, so the, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that you had uh, said that once uh, patients were uh, triggered for in a, a referral to you, that all those patients, or, or correct me if I'm wrong, most of or all of those patients underwent uh, a duplex ultrasound of the fistula or the graft. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. We like to know that when we're giving a patient to the clinic, that they are gonna have the best opportunity to be successful in the middle of all of these dialogues about quality, et cetera, so on and so forth of the patients. And uh, it's so easy to forget their experience in this, this circumstance. Miscannulation is, is not a trifling thing. Um, and if you've had the opportunity to experience and see the horrific uh, consequences of what that can look like, you know, it's, it's nothing, nothing trivial. So 
So we do like to provide as much meaningful information to the clinic that, that allows them to have the greatest assurance that they're going to be successful. And if you think about it from the clinic's standpoint, we often think from us as the provider, you know, what's our experience? Well, the clinic has a lot of reticence. There's a lot of fear on the clinic side. They get a new access. Maybe their surgeon isn't the most approachable guy. Uh, maybe the access service that is caring for the patient isn't the most available. And you miscannulate an access, which happens, by the way. Most clinics are not using ultrasound. I have a million dollars in my room, and sometimes I struggle to get a, a cath or a wire across these accesses. And these people are you know, using fingers and just pulsatile technique to identify where that access is. And you, you drive this 10 penny nail into this access that's maybe deep. They have nothing to go on, but a clinical exam. Uh, so, you know, trying to improve the patient experience as well as the uh, technician's experience, uh, I think is, is imperative on us as, as being a team member to make sure that we put people in the best position to succeed. So the patients that are referred to you that are um, maybe they've, you know, there's a reported history of outflow issues or, or decreased flow during dialysis, like I think you referenced a 25% drop from their baseline. What happens if the uh, duplex uh, turns out to be normal, they don't identify stenosis, and it looks very similar to the baseline, like following creation? So what happens to that patient? Well, so if you've met k Doki criteria mm -hmm. uh, at that at that time, uh, we would default, you know, and and... and Again, try to clarify what is going on. Is the patient short of breath? Are they having new cardiac output issues? Do we get an echo? Uh, there's a whole lot of patient behind the access circuit. It's easy, low-lying fruit, as you know, in any hospital system from infection to, you know, you name it, patient needs a haircut. They're going to call you first uh, because the patient had dialysis, right? And you yes. need to know about it. So... Uh, we, we do find that volume plays a role. Uh, some patients are more adherent to their medical plan than others. We, we ask for them to look at their dry weight. What are they gaining between, et cetera, so on and so forth? Are they taking blood pressure medications appropriately? Have they skimped on their, um, you know, their cardiac meds for one reason or another? Maybe they're financially strapped and you find out they're not taking their medicines or they misunderstood how to take their medicines and so their cardiac performance falls off. And so we can unmask many of those things by just asking basic questions. All right. So let's just say that the patient uh, is referred to you for uh, a duplex and, you know, it was an outflow issue and then you identify an outflow uh, stenosis. Uh, what happens next? Well, so if we've identified that, what we, we do then is we triage to where are we? Uh, we we looking at immediate failure here uh, within the next day or so, or do we have a little bit more time? So, uh, and that's a clinical judgment, to be frank. Um, we look at the flow rate in that access, uh, brachial artery flow rate, as well as the access circuit rate. Uh, is their clot being formed in the access circuit or not? If it's an immediate pending failure, we'll send the patient same day to OR which we have a, you know, block for, and we just add the patient on and we will operate on that patient. And if they are not in that circumstance, well, then we put them on a more elective uh, schedule, which in my mind is somewhere between one to two weeks typically. Okay. Let's back up a, a hair and then talk about uh, patients that do need um, some kind of intervention. Can you differentiate a little bit for um, our trainees or, or people early on in the practice can you tease apart inflow issues versus outflow issues, or maybe not inflow issues and outflow issues, inflow symptoms and outflow symptoms? Yeah, you know, there's, it's, it's um, I think, you know, clinically, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty straightforward, really. We, I like to use the straight arm test, you know, it's, it's a pretty simple straight test. You, you have a patient who has an existing access, and if you just raise the arm, you know, the fistula will tend to collapse uh, pretty quickly if it, if it has an inflow issue. And, and the same can be said uh, for grafts too. You can feel the weakness of the thrill and you can feel the pulsation of the brachial artery or the radial artery proximal, which is where most of our accesses uh, reside as, as a brachial or radial based. And if you're, if you're looking at outflow issues, they certainly have much more of, of a pulsatile water hammer uh, exam. And that should never be the case. And that tends to dictate a pending failure very, very quickly. So that, those are just two quick clinical things. Obviously, with the advent of the ultrasound being so 
broadly available. I mean, they're even available now in your pocket with these, you know, like these butterfly sort of technology that you can walk around with and just ultrasound everybody. I mean, you can un unmask all kinds of pathology should you desire, right? But, but I think those are quick things just to look at. Okay. And as far as outflow uh, symptoms, maybe not on physical exam, but some of the things that maybe your nephrologist or dialysis access may see in terms of uh, they may report for outflow issues like prolonged bleeding or uh, clotting uh, during dialysis. Can you talk a little bit about those too? Well, it sounds like you've received that call. Uh, so. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so, yeah. So, I got the nod on this podcast. This is a part of my practice also. But. <laughs> Right, Bro so brother said, in arms, brother in arms. Yeah, well, so you nailed it, right? I mean, so very classically, um, you know, you can see a number of things. You can see venous engorgement in the arm, depending on where it is. If the arm, so first of all, I like to say, if the arm is completely swollen, that more often portends central venous stenosis than just an extremity stenosis within the access circuit. When you have an outflow issue, uh, more typically, you do get pulsatility. And if you think about it, uh, all those cars are trying to get off the road, right? I, I just look at a Navy access circuit as nothing more than highway driving. And the access circuit behaves the way I would behave and have behaved, right? So you're driving, you've got a four-lane highway, and then there's three lanes, then there's two lanes, and then suddenly it stops. Well, that's similar to what happens in AV access. There becomes a critical point in which you are either driving off the road, in which case you start to get sort of aneurysmal changes, right? Everyone's on the shoulder and you're like, look at all these lunatics. I should probably follow them. And you do the same. And then you look for the exit ramps where you see multiple, multiple collaterals. And oftentimes you see these in conjunction uh, and then you get these, you know, obviously the erosive changes because of the pressure between the access underlying the skin and the skin and the axis can't grow through the bones. So it chooses to grow through the skin. Uh, and so that's where you get sort of, uh, you know, arterialization of the world's uh, blood flow when, when you rupture those AV accesses by untreated stenosis and one sideitis, right? It is typically a part of that as well, where they continue to cannulate these accesses despite uh, all the things we're talking about. And there's a high pressure outflow stenosis as well, critical. So... All right. So a patient ends up in your operating room. Can you talk a little bit about your technique as to how you approach, you know, fistula access and, uh, you know, the rest of the procedure as far as, you know, diagnostic angio and potential um, plasty? Yeah, no. So I think this is really where it gets exciting. Um, you know, to be honest with you, there's just so much attention because of the cost of care that industry for the very first time in my experience is really dedicated to creating some great tools. And the tools are not only great for the patient, but they're great for us as the interventionalist too. And the chameleon, for example, is, is such a technology that we leverage very, very heavily. And the reason we do so is this is a chameleon PTA balloon. You announced it at the initial part of the segment. And what that affords you is not only a relatively high pressure balloon, but also an injection port that's available uh, just proximal to the balloon. So number one, you have, you can go in sheathless if you desire. So if you think about accesses that are not maturing, the footprint that you leave in access uh, is meaningful, right? Many of the sheaths we use are six and up in size. Um, you know, you can do this from either a radial artery approach. Uh, you can do this you know, directly through the vein and you have a very small footprint, essentially using a five uh, millimeter footprint is essentially what you're left with as opposed to six and up. And, and then again, so you don't, you don't have a wound after there's no suture line, it's just digital pressure. So, but if we're in the access circuit, I typically am a buddy. I'm going to assume that we have a venous outflow stenosis for, sure. this, for the sake of conversation. So we are in related to flow which is different than the arm, right? So with regard to flow, we're in a proximal access. So we're just about one, two finger breaths beyond the anastomosis with the vein. Got it. And we're now directed centrally with our approach. So we go in with a micropuncture, put an 018, 5, uh, or 4 introducer, exchange to an 035, chameleon balloon, versus if I think there's further intervention necessary, you know, I may then decide to put in a sheath. But if we have a fixed, small, single site lesion, we can easily just put that chameleon in over that 035 wire, cross the lesion, inject, deflate the balloon, and immediately see the effects of our treatment. So let me, so one, let me back you up about uh, two questions. So one, as far as access site, whenever you're choosing access and you're saying, oh, just a little bit uh, distal to the JA segment, ultrasound guidance or just palpation to get in? 
more and more ultrasound because we're doing so many more percutaneous techniques with, you know, percutaneous fistula, et cetera, that I think that ultrasound skills are mandatory, particularly in this new era. Okay. So I think the more facile, the better. All right. And then, so you're, uh, you, you go in, you, you've converted to the, do you actually, do you do a diagnostic um, angio with like the uh, transitional sheath in or? Yes. Have, Okay. All right. All right. So you've kind of, you've, before any 035 or 038 wires are in, you've kind of laid out the whole dialysis tract and you've seen the stenoses that are going to be there, right? Yeah. I kind of jumped over that. Uh, no, no. So well, I, I, I get it. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of built-in knowledge here as, as the host though. I, that's, that's what I'm here for. Well, that's why you're my brother in arms. Thank that's you right. for picking that's me right. up. All right. So you've laid out, you've gotten your lay of the land, you know where the stenoses are. And then uh, subsequently, cross with the 035 system and then you you bear back the chameleon in and and so I, I've never used the chameleon so so I don't know how this helps but I, I know I mean I've seen the picture of it um, it's got the side port so basically you go in plasty and then after that you just keep all your wire access like you don't have to lose wire access correct that's right that's right okay and then you keep the balloon at that same place or you pull it back a, a little bit proximal to the stenosis right well so I think it really depends on where you are. And a lot of this has to do with your, you know, I think your your clinical comfort uh, of where you are. If you look at a lot of these lesions, if they're super tight, and for me, when I when I'm using a balloon, you know, typically it's six, eight, nine, you know, millimeter balloon somewhere in there, and you get like these very, very, very tight waists. When those go away, mm -hmm. depending on how much waist you had on that balloon, oftentimes there can be a pretty good blush. So if I'm if I'm doing that in the central venous system, I'm not moving. Okay. Right. Right. I'll drop the balloon and shoot, get a quick digital subtraction image, make sure. And then I'll drop and then I'll shoot again uh, with regular fluoro just to make sure there's no contrast trace. Now, if, if there is no blush, I'll back the balloon away and get a, a separate angiogram. Um, so I can see that lesion much more clearly and appreciate, Hey, do I need to upsize or have we got the job complete here? So I think that has a lot to do with with my comfort level, right? And even with the balloon up, I think that if you look at, you know, some of the recent data with drug drug coated balloons, et cetera, uh, a lot of the data now really portends the fact that we've done a miserable job with our balloon angioplasties because if both the Lutonic study and the impact trial both have shown that protracted high pressure balloon angioplasty is meaningful. And I think, you know, I had traditionally been an up down, you know, get the balloon, get the waist, see you later, we're done. Uh, now we're really doing a much more protracted angioplasty. And again, I think it's nice to have the chameleon there because it's entertaining, at least for me in that, you know, that 90 <laughs> seconds. Well, I can look at the rest of this access circuit while the balloon is up, right? So I can inject right from where I'm treating and then reflux uh, and get the rest of the information. So it's really, it's, it's, it's been helpful in that regard. So Kate, I, I didn't know that you could do this with the chameleon. I guess I just imagined in a way. So if you're if you're up, so you're doing the prolonged uh, angioplasty. And actually, that's one thing I wanted to touch on. So you do a 90 uh, second inflation, like put it on the timer, stay up 90 seconds. Yeah, well, I, I don't think so. Okay, um, okay. I, I'd like to say so. So, so what I have is a, is a little approaching yeah. ninety seconds. Well, so I have a little different theory, right? Okay. And, and I'll grant you, it's my own theory, and this is kind of my technique. And and I've spoken to this before with other people. I don't know that the absolute time means anything. I think the elasticity means more. So when you're dialing up uh, atmospheres of pressure, let's just say your opening pressure was twenty. In other words, you get full effacement at twenty atmospheres right? That's your effacement pressure. Oftentimes, what you will see is the dial start to sneak down and creep to 18, 15, right? Well, what we do is keep dialing that pressure up so that the effacement pressure is at 20. And when we are at 20 and can hold 20 for 15 real seconds, okay. then we will drop. So it is a timed angioplasty, but it's not just a, a random number. It's more, you know, more around what the patient's elasticity of that lesion that you're trying to treat. I mean, that's the whole idea is to treat the lesion. So the elasticity means more to me than the time. Okay, absolutely. Going back to you having the balloon up and being able to shoot that reflux run. So is that what's uh, possible with the chameleon? So it's got the sidearm and then where the actual contrast exits, like if you have a, the, the balloon up 
outflow stenosis, you can reflux and see like the arterial. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You I, see didn't, the I, didn't it, I didn't know if it. I didn't know if it went distal, like I or uh, you know uh, central. I guess would be the word. Yeah. No. No. So what it does is it's just what you've said, right? So the balloon is up, and then you're out of the radiation field. By the way, you're giving a smaller contrast dose. Uh, you get to see the entire circuit leading up to the stenosis. So you you tend to go in whatever opposite direction the balloon is up. You're getting the flow the other way. Uh, and then you can assess, you know, your 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 upstream effects because you may need to go the other way and address something that you hadn't identified just yet. For sure. And then when you drop the balloon, by the way, all that contrast then runs off. And now you've got your distal angiogram as well. So uh, let me paint a couple different scenarios and, and see if you approach them in any different way. Um, say you do your uh, diagnostic angio of a dialysis circuit and you have an instant stenosis. So maybe uh, either you left a stent or um, it's from outside referral. Do you approach instant stenoses any differently? Uh, those can be, you know, wicked challenging. Let me just use, use that northern expression. All right. Uh, wicked challenging, right? Instant stenosis is, is really nothing fun to deal with. High pressure balloon, probably oftentimes exceeding, you know, the burst capacity of what we're talking about with a chameleon. I'm often using at this point, you know, other balloons. Uh, I've traditionally either used Conquest, but now more specifically, I really like the crossing profile and opening pressure of uh, Boston Scientific's new balloon. Okay. It's, it's beautiful, uh, the Athletis. And so being able to get that high pressure inflation, sometimes we'll use cutting balloons very rarely and off-label use, completely off-label use, we've explored using DCB. Right. So those those have traditionally been it. I don't typically like to reline, you know, covered stents with more covered stents. And I don't ever use bare metal uh, in the AV access circuit. You know, traditionally what we see is, you know, I think of it as like mosquito uh, netting, you know, like or dropping your lawn fence on your lawn. Right. What okay. happens is the neontomal hyperplasia grows through and you've got a jailed segment for life. So let me back up and, and just make sure that some of the like, people that can gloss over this. So in the dialysis circuit, non-covered stents. No, no use for it. You don't see any utility. And I see only if you want to see the patient forever. Okay. All right. That's fair. What about relining a non-covered with a covered? Fair well, game? certainly. Okay. Yeah. I think that's very fair game. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, are there any locations in the Dallas circuit, like say maybe cephalic arch where, or I guess like, what is your approach to stenting? Like in, in what situations do you like covered stents? Um, and in, in which situations maybe do you think you're, they're overused? Well, I think, you know, my experience is I was a heavy user of stents and started becoming much, much more aggressive with, with DCB. Um, and so my stent use honestly has fallen off in almost all areas. And uh, we are using a tremendous amount of impact AV DCB right now and seeing huge results that, that really are impressive. And so my earlier use of stent use was, was most commonly graphenous anastomosis mm -hmm. uh, encephalic arch and then bailout for rupture. We had a smaller proportion of cases which would go central because of the large amount of catheter abuse that the patients have been subjected to. Now, I would say that our stent use is fractional, given the use of DCB. Typically, you know, we're seeing, well, heck, I had, you know, this is a complete anecdote, but we had a guy, you know, we, we just did 487 days uh, between treatments uh, using that DCB. I keep an internal, you know, uh, record of where we are and uh, it makes a big difference. But but cephalic arch would be my number one pull because the cephalic arch is probably the highest rate of failure that you will see in most circuits, that and graph venous. And if you think about it, most Americans, Western society, we're doing brachiocephalic fistulas. And if you were, you know, if you look at Japan and, and these other countries, Europe, et cetera, they're much more dominated by radiocephalic fistula. We're not seeing patients there. Most of the patients are coming to the hospital. Their veins have been gobbled up by uh, IVs, et cetera. And so we're left fi finding vein. And so typically brachiocephalic. And so when you look at the failure mode of a brachiocephalic fistula, the failure mode is the cephalic arch, high flow. Uh, you know, it's, it's got much fascia bound down there. It's turbulent flow, et cetera. It's a flexion point, constant motion, and you see high rates of failure. So that was traditionally where I would get it. Now, also, uh, I would find that those lesions are more indicative of a rupture 
than the cannulation zone and proximal elements of a fistula. And so I was bailing out there more frequently. I was seeing a lot of failure modes. And mostly when I was placing stents prior to DCB, it was because of the accelerated injury that you would see. You would treat the patient, mm -hmm. break the stenosis. And by breaking the stenosis, you're creating a new injury. And then you get the recurrent cycle. So gotcha. th that's what the DCB is interrupted. Okay. So DCBs, it was one thing I had on uh, my list of things to talk about and sounds like it's already made its way into your practice. You've kind of given a, a nice endorsement of DCBs. Are, are there, were there any challenges or hurdles to overcome? Like for someone who hasn't worked that into their practice yet, can you kind of speak to what your early on experience was and what were some of the pushbacks, either from a cost perspective or uh, a lack of literature perspective that made it difficult to incorporate the DCBs into your practice? Yeah, I can, I can talk to that. I think it, it um, I think that, you know, what, what we saw originally was we had a lot of optimism with DCB. It was, you know, I think Latonics came to market first and, you know, I just didn't really see sort of the results that I was hoping to see. And we were paying, you know, a fair amount for those. Now, as an HOPD, we have a lot more leeway than ambulatory uh, centers do. Uh, and certainly freestanding access centers that are office extensions really, you know, under a different pressure than I am. So my biggest, you know, uh, argument when I present to the hospital, the value analysis, you know, team is, hey, what's, what's, is the juice worth the squeeze? Yeah. That's what they really want to know, right? Let's just, let's just talk real, right? So you're paying twelve, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500 for a balloon. Is it going to be worth it? Well, initially, you know, we, we were, it was a mixed bag for us. You know, we weren't getting the results we wanted. Then, you know, uh, the impact study came out and I wasn't ready to just sort of abandon it. And we started trialing these balloons and, and lo and behold, we started to find that the data was substantiated by our internal benchmarks that we had seen. And so then it became, you know, pretty easy. And, uh, and I've said this before many times in my facility, we were grateful for that to be the case because there was this little thing called a pandemic that kind of rolled through the country. And, you know, patients, you know, were afraid to come to hospitals. They were fact, they were afraid. We, everyone was afraid, right? I mean, less so now, but, but still a lot of reticence about where to get responsible care healthily and stay healthily safe. So the DCB played a big part of, of our ability to treat those patients and ensure that the patient would not have to come back to the hospital. They weren't crashing with failed dialysis access. And we saw a lot of longevity there. Right. And, and it made a big difference. All right. So, the, yeah. So the admission rate went down and et cetera. OK. I like that. I, I mean, I think there's always a lot of power in uh, practices that, you know, track their internal metrics and see if they align with, you know, the, the high minded, perfect practice of, you know, what sometimes these uh, randomized control trials are trying to achieve. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of power in that and talking with administration. Um, so kudos to your practice for for being that well set up. One of the other things I wanted to talk about quickly, just hemostasis whenever after you're done with your procedure. So, you know, you've angioplasty and I mean, I, I guess in, if you're bare backing, you know, a, a five millimeter balloon, then it's just, you know, two fingers and, and walk out. Pretty much. That's, That's nice. right. Yeah. But if you're, but if you're, if you're not, and to be fair, uh, we, we do still use plenty of, of sheaths. Sure. You know, we're using, you know, simple suture around around the sheath exit site and, and pulling it and then it's just direct pressure. And we'll typically hold another little caveat, by the way, whenever we do angioplasty, you know, we always are holding the arterial inflow so we don't have that big pressure head against the, the vein on the outflow. And that is the same when we take the sheaths out, right? We're holding arterial pressure, so proximal to the sheath in the direction of flow. So um, just before the sheath. If we're going anagrade kind of. towards the central system, we're holding pressure and collapsing that pressure down, pull the sheath, stitch, and then we'll maintain pressure there more predominantly just to achieve a small thrill so it's not quite clotted off, but it's just barely getting enough flow to maintain. Well, pressure there for a couple of minutes, make sure the patient doesn't have a hematoma, or cause a secondary injury, and then a Band-Aid, and then they can go. Okay. We also, uh, I think maybe people uh, who don't, have worked this into the practice or they haven't heard of it. So when you angioplasty and outflow stenosis and then you're bringing down the balloon, will you kind of describe what you do on the arterial end and why? 
Yeah, well, I, again, I think if you're if you're looking at, at our patients, right, we know that the you have a tremendous amount of blood flow running through these circuits. And so to be clear, what does that mean? So a standard brachial artery, yours and mine, will hold somewhere between 80 and 100 mLs of blood flow. Second, you start to create a meaningful AV access, that blood flow will go up over 1,000, 1,500, sometimes in excess of 3,000 mLs a minute. And that blood flow has got to go somewhere, and that's called your access circuit most often. Right. And so all of that blood flow is is going. And by the way, most of our patients are what? Hypertensive. Right. And so their blood pressure is somewhere 200. I mean, I had someone in there who was 235 over 140. I mean, this is not an outrageous number to see. It's not a completely unexpected number to see in a patient. So when we do complete occlusive flow, if because the stenosis is being treated and the balloon is up and you're getting full effacement, all of that pressure is waiting to burst through that dam. And so what I like to do is as the balloon is going up, I am decreasing at the arterial anastomosis, I am occluding the AV access inflow. And then when we're done with the treatment, we will release it just a little bit again to restore some flow to shoot the angiogram to establish the result rather than just letting that whole pressure head run through this freshly dilated lesion, which may have been a very aggressive lesion. And we find that that has improved uh, significantly the, the risk of rupture, frank rupture, and again, bailout sort of procedures. And if you do get a, a problem, typically it's just balloon occlusion again, uh, wait three minutes or so, real minutes, by the way, at that time. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I do want to back uh, that up also for our audience. So like if you do rupture a stenosis uh, after angioplasty, oftentimes if you're using a sheath, it's, it's helpful to keep your balloon on the wire. So if you have to run it up pretty quickly, then uh, what Ari was saying is you just throw your balloon up, wait three, uh, three, five minutes or whatever your number is, and then you're actually just getting an occlusion with the balloon in place, right? Yeah, that's another plug for Chameleon while you're looking at it. I mean, there oh, you yeah. are. You, you know immediately, right? Because the, sure. the injection port is literally two millimeters behind the balloon. So when you inject, you know right now. Uh, so you don't get that. Again, now think about the volume of blood we just talked sure. about. You're talking liters of minute. Uh, in a tiny space. And so if you have the balloon right there and you have the injection port right there, there is literally no delay between the the treatment and the immediate tactile knowledge that you've had a success and that you're safe. Right, right. All right. So now I want to talk a little bit about after the patient's been treated, um, how do you follow these patients up? Um, do you return them? Well, I'll just yeah, I'll leave it open-ended. How do you follow these guys up? Well, so the patient will come back to the office. We typically have a standing appointment for those patients. Again, same seven to 10 days, they have an office follow up with us. Now, many patients will or will not make that appointment if their dialysis has gone well. Got it. Uh, and again, then that becomes that whole dialogue with our dialysis centers. How is the patient doing? Um, and are they continuing to meet uh, dialysis endpoints as prescribed by the nephrologist? And again, anytime we see those patients, and then it starts right back where we were. They are following transonics, et cetera. The pa regardless of that, by the way, we do like to have a firm annual appointment with our patients regardless, because there are things, as you are aware of in the access world, where they get missed. You know, these centers are just unaware of what surgical access complications look like. It's not their fault. They're not surgeons and they're not interventionalists. They've been looking at the same access and sometimes fresh eyes really identify new problems and we're able to screen that out for the patient and keep them safe. Okay. If you have a patient that is getting seen pretty regularly, uh, let's say every uh, four months, uh, they're getting referred back to you for the same uh, outflow stenosis. Uh, do you do anything different with that as far as like either having that patient on a routine four month, like you just know to see them every four months, or do you let them kind of get plugged back into the system? I'll let you take that scenario. Mixed bag right there. You know, so first of all, kind of illegal to have someone on a, <laughs> on a, you know, round the top, you know, Hey, right. we're gonna oh, you I know, again I know you're going to be ready in four minutes. Yeah. Four <laughs> months. Right. Yeah. No. So, so we tend to be a little bit laissez faire when that goes, we tend to call the clinics and nudge them as to, Hey, are we still okay? Because we have a history of this patient. Typically, it's it's not just an angioplasty. Typically, it's a thrombosis where we're encountering this problem more than just, you know, high pressures during dialysis and frustration. The clinics are pretty good about letting us know that there are problems, sometimes too good about letting us know <laughs> that there are problems. Uh, I'm saying that tongue in cheek. 
Um, but you know what I mean? I mean, there's the, the problem is often not identifying the patient. It's, it's really just aligning the right therapy. And sometimes you have to change your plan. And again, I default back to our original conversation. What, what is the patient's life expectancy? I mean, you can't know that for sure. But there's an illusion, too, I think, that the next interventions can be better than your first and that your next access is going to be better than the one you have. Mm -hmm. And I've been bitten by that optimism bug before and have really, you know, kicked myself and the patients wanting to kick me as well for abandoning access that we thought we would be better next. And instead, they've got a nerve injury or a vascular injury, steel, you name it, uh, on the other arm. And now you're, you're worse than you were. So I think leveraging the technologies, changing technologies, right? I think it's important to know what you did prior and then gauge that, again, that by keeping that registry, hey, we saw you 89 days ago. Well, hey, now we're seeing you 45 days ago. So, you know, at that point, I think we're, all right, well, let's, let's look at DCB or, you know, hey, is there a role for a coverage then, right? I think that's where you start to deploy different technologies versus, hey, do we need to jump to a different segment with a surgical revision? And depending on where you are, you can either safely mitigate that with an open surgical revision versus, let's just be honest, you know, if I were a patient, I would want a percutaneous uh, intervention way in advance of, you know, surgeon cutting my skin. Sure. I guess that is kind of in line with, or that kind of touches on my my second question, my second scenario setup was that at what point do you begin thinking about a surgical revision or a new access site for your patients who are who are pre presenting pretty often with thrombosis. And, and I don't know how to define uh, very often, but you know, does it, at some point when somebody's coming to you for repeated uh, declot, at what point do you say, okay, this, this access site, like I've, I've tried everything. Like, when do you say, like, we need to start thinking about uh, new access? Well, I think, uh, you know, that that is certainly the art. Yeah. M more than the science, to be fair. I think you can look, you know, in many different directions, but the first direction I look to is the patient, right? Because ultimately you can't go wrong by abiding the patient's wishes. You can go far afield when you put your goals and aspirations in front of the patients. And when I talk to the patients, I can tell them very honestly, these have been our results. You're the one who's having to come back. If this is unmanageable for you, and is becoming a frustration and impediment to you financially or pain, et cetera, here are our options. Again, keeping in mind, many patients will be resistant to uh, open surgery, mm -hmm. and they're certainly resistant to just changing or abandoning access sites. So, uh, and, and I don't blame them. Their dexterity is at risk. You know, being able to, you know, just button your pants, open the car door, uh, it, it's not a, a trifling thing if, you, if you've got stocking glove uh, neuropathy to begin with and now uh, you're risking steel in your dominant hand because most of these accesses are non-dominant. Or if you went from a radiocephalic fistula that's sort of miserable and now you go to an upper arm access and you're not doing a proximal radial artery, but now you're doing a brachial artery and you increase the risk of steel, big decision uh, for that patient. So I think the more we can engage patients, the better to uh, include them. That's, I think, proper consent. That being said, I do like the idea. We, we haven't been able to incorporate it very well of doing TEG to evaluate uh, the access circuit to determine what perhaps in the clotting cascade can we interrupt with a more specified drug. I think that the uh, the treatment algorithms have been everywhere from, oh, we'll just give them aspirin. Oh, we'll give them aspirin and Plavix. Oh, we'll give them fish oil, aspirin and Plavix. Oh, we'll add Coumadin. Oh, no, now we're going to do Eliquis, you know, and, and and on and on and on. And I think all of that is are just stabs in the dark. But I think a more elegant opportunity probably lies with a uh, thromboelastogram of some form to determine where the clotting cascade is activated right now in the moment. Uh, and I, I think that there is a lot of promise in that direction moving forward. Is that a part of your practice currently? So I've tried, you know, to get it built in to my practice. I haven't even recorded the very first patient yet. Okay. <laughs> so the answer is no. But um, but when you look at what, you know, what was done with trauma and elsewhere, you know, in the rheologic system, I think it makes a lot of sense and, and, and should be applied. I think it would just give us a little bit more elegant solutions. And I think that's the whole point of, of science. Sure. All right. Well, we'll get you back on the show once you work it out. Okay. 
<laughs> See in about 30 years, yeah, my yeah. friend. All right. So moving on to like the, the data component of, of the podcast, can you uh, reference any or, or mention any helpful papers for trainees out there who are, are looking for extra information on this or any papers that you found particularly helpful, you know, that, that kind of uh, paint with broad strokes what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve with uh, these dialysis patients? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, number one, if we're going to talk about, you know, which we kind of highlighted today uh, somewhat purposefully was the chameleon balloon. I think, it, you know, we use this thing aggressively for central venous stenosis, for thrombectomy, which there'll be a publication in the JVA uh, that I was a part of, and that'll be coming. We use it for balloon-assisted maturation, fibrin sheath disruption, retrograde lesions, et cetera, even banding. And, you know, there are a number of uh, publications that are coming out, uh, which I can send to you on a separate list that you can maybe add to show notes, et cetera. But there's procedural comparison of standard PTA balloon for fistula graft maintenance. Um, there's fistula plasty with radiation savings uh, in the sheathless catheter. Uh, Dr. Sharaf uh, did one with the sheathless balloon maturation abstract that was ASDIN 2020. Uh, and even in June of 2021, we had a featured article in Endovascular Today. Uh, that referenced it. Uh, more broadly speaking, if you're if you're talking, uh, ASDIN has a really nice resource for trainees that's free, and I think that that is a is a very nice opportunity for trainees uh, and even you know attendings. Heck, I look at it my own self all the time, you know, trying to figure out the best opportunities uh, for our patients. Oh, what, uh, what was that? AS, ASDIN. Yeah, ASDIN. There's a, a a web page. Let me reference it for you here. It's ASDIN. It's a, a primer of in, to interventional uh, nephrology, uh, an MR Almeny, uh, MD out of Birmingham, Alabama. Nice. He uh, he's put that together as as a PDF. And when I talk about other ones, Kidney Academy has really comes to mind as being. A, a fabulous uh, resource for not only trainees, but attendings. Uh, some of the world's greatest uh, access people, I think, uh, are on uh, on that frequently commenting uh, on the happenings in access, uh, all things that you can imagine. Uh, I get an email at least two, three, four times weekly regarding access-related issues. And they were, I told them that we would be on uh, today talking and they were kind enough to extend a free coat uh, to oh, the cool. end of June. Yeah. So it's back table 21 conveniently. Right. Yeah. So back table 21 and it, it is world-class, I think, site to uh, be in touch with some world-class surgeons. So the, the guys who are moving the field are, are frequently talking playing tennis with one another over these various <laughs> technologies, and it's sort of blinded to uh, industry preference. So it's really nice to see. All right. We'll make sure we include basically everything that you reference. Like, so for, to the audience, if we've referenced anything and, and you happen to not be able to jot it down fast enough because you listen to these podcasts at 2x like I do, then we'll make sure we include all this stuff in the show notes, which are usually out about one week after. All right, Ari, um, any stone left uncovered? Is there anything we didn't mention? Anything, any question you're like, wow, why didn't Chris come at me with this? Well, I guess if you could answer why the Jets have been so miserable uh, since 1969, I would love an answer to that because, <laughs> my God, am I hungry for a Super Bowl. Fair and enough. That, um, Fair enough. Yeah. No one's got that answer. No one's got that answer. All right, guys, uh, to our audience, thank you for listening. If you guys enjoyed the podcast but want more, please check out the show notes of this episode. Those are going to be found at www.backtable.com. Very easy to remember. If you enjoyed the podcast and want to support the show, here are two easy ways. First, take one second, press the subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening on right now. This helps platforms like iTunes or Spotify know that you, our audience, value what we're doing and you're interested in getting our latest content as we're producing it. Second, if you're really getting value from these podcasts, please go to iTunes, leave us a short written review. This helps us in so many different ways. Plus, we love to get the feedback. That wraps things up. We'll see you next time on the Back Table Podcast.